Hello, this is my third research log, and today we will be moving from the realm of more of a physical chemistry to a biomolecular chemistry. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to talk about today is the tardigrade. Now, what is the tardigrade, you may ask? Well, some people call it the water bear, but really, it's probably the most alien-like animal that we've ever really seen in history before. So out of the 30-something phyla in Kingdom Animalia, the tardigrade is the most foreign. It actually has its own phylum. So unlike most animals, which have 1% foreign DNA, the tardigrade has a sixth of its DNA as foreign or alien. So why is it so special? Well, first of all, it's really tiny. The largest ones are about... 1.2 millimeters long and um, well it can survive in the radiation of space which is pretty extreme because the Sun is always throwing radiation such as just random particles out and it can also survive at really low temperatures and really high temperatures pretty close to absolute zero above the wa above water's boiling point and then we're talking about it can survive in the deepest trenches of the ocean and it does need water but it can it can attain water from thin films of water in soil and so this makes it a very very special animal but what allows it to do this well the reason that the tardigrade is able to do this is because of a sugar called trehalose i still kind of have trouble pronouncing it but Trehalose. And basically what it is is two alpha glucose molecules. And we remember glucose from high school biology. It's what allows cellular respiration to occur in animals and really allows us to get energy. And without energy, what would where would we be? And it's held together by an alpha, alpha one one glucoside bond. Now you may ask, what is this? Well, it's just not such a strong bond that holds two glu glucose molecules together. And so in the tardigrade, what occurs is that these this bond is just completely destroyed and this glucose is used for who knows what it's used for tons of things. It's used for energy, it's used to help it shrivel up and survive in really dry environments. It could survive in a desert for decades at a time. And it also helps with many other aspects of life and many other animals. It's just not present in other animals. So what else does it help with? Alright, so the first thing it does is decrease many diseases. So, which diseases, you may ask? So, when tested on a certain kind of nematode, uh, it showed positive results for decreasing the effects of aging. And this was because there's this pathway in our body called the IGF-1 pathway. And when insulin flows through it, its walls start to swell. And this, this causes a lot of our aging. And so... This could decrease a lot of the effects of aging, allowing us to live longer. But again, this has only been tested on nematodes because of dosage problems that have occurred with testing this on humans. Also, this is an enhancer of autophagocytosis, or autophagy. And what is autophagy? Well, it's sort of like apoptosis. It's like a programmed cell death. And so, because of this, now we have enhanced lipid metabolism and lipids, um, it's kind of another way to say fats, but it's just lipids are any molecules that don't really dissolve in, um, any organic molecules that don't absorb in water that are present in our bodies. And so with this, with autophagy, what else can it do? Well, it can also reduce and invert neurotoxins and this is actually quite amazing because this 
could possibly serve as a cure for diseases like Huntington's, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's. And so with not maybe not cures, but just various options to reduce the effects of these diseases, we're talking about trehalose being a very beneficial uh, molecule for mankind. So there are two theories about how this could work in humans, and those are vitrification theory and water displacement theory. And they both kind of work the same way, except in opposite on opposite sides. So with vitrification theory, it's how liquidated um, liquidated molecules, liquidated carbohydrates, they um, they cool, they become solid without actually crystallizing, and it's just about preventing ice formation. And this is probably the best proof, or just the best argument, really, the best accepted theory for how trehalose could benefit the human body. And the other theory is water displacement theory, and this is how water is replaced by trehalose. So in tardigrades, when trehalose is formed, it acts as just a backup molecule for when you don't have any water, then you can break the alpha, alpha-1, one, one glucoside bonds, and now you have energy to run, to barely survive, really to remain in a state of dormancy for who knows how long many many decades all right so you may ask how are the neurotoxins in this actually reduced so let's say we're talking about some hd disease so we're talking about a very unstable non-soluble amino acid which looks something like this these circles representing weaker bonds and so what happens is that this disease kind of folds up in a very compact structure, still kind of loosely tied, but it forms an aggregate, and this aggregation is what really um, induces the disease. So how can we prevent this? Some scientists put in some trehalose, because even in vitro, um, preventing the aggregation of the HD diseases was very difficult. So they put in the trehalose, and it wasn't even from really the heat shock or anything, but the trehalose itself was able to disentangle this whole HD um, structure, and then we were able to really stop this. But this was only with mice. It has been tested up to only 50 grams with humans because it is considered dangerous if we consume it in quantities of more than 50 grams. But... Um, we are researching ways to combine trehalose into a more, an even more complex molecule to make it more easily implemented into the human body without causing any sort of harmful effect. So the molecules that my team and I have been working with are essentially rapamycin and mTOR. But what happens is rapamycin, a molecule that's really complicated, but shaped kind of like this, I don't know, it looks kind of like Texas, but it goes into um, mTOR plus a various other number of molecules and um, nutrients are added, autophagy occurs, tons of other processes like uh, cellular pro proliferation, uh, transcription, and who knows how many other processes. And... After all of that, then you end up with cell growth, which essentially equals less neurotoxins. And that is our goal, to be able to achieve this efficiently without affecting how much dosage you can really um, apply. Because you would add this to trehalose, and all this would occur. An effective molecule for human consumption over 50 grams. And so when that occurs, then we are talking about a much longer lifespan and much less suffering due to neurodegeneration. In the last video, I talked about uranium enrichment and how quantum entanglement with uranium-235, because of its smaller mass, being able to get closer together and the uranium-238, these bigger circles representing U-238, U-238 
the smaller ones representing U-235. This increased ionization is really mostly possible or most efficiently possible with certain frequencies of light induced upon it. So these frequencies are in the infrared range, but this would make the process way more efficient and therefore it would just be a much more feasible process to use to create nuclear weapons or for the benefit of mankind with uh, nuclear power. In this video, I talked about Trahalos and all the effects. I'd like to give a special thank to Fianco Buckle. He is a co-leader of the research team that I'm working with. I'd also like to give th a big thanks to the research team that I am working with at Wheeler High School. So thank you for your help with this project. We are still researching. If you have any comments for us, please comment on this video, and thank you for your time.